You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast, and my guest is Beth Zupek Kenya. Uh, she's a world-renowned ketogenic expert, clinician, and a speaker. She's a registered and certified dietitian and a nutritionist, and for 25 years, she's been coaching medical professionals, patients, and families uh, through the use of nutritional ketosis for neurological disorders, certain cancers, and other metabolic conditions. And she has a private practice, but also is the primary consultant for the Charlie Foundation. So, uh, Beth, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. No, you're so welcome. Yeah. Well, the question I always ask people in the health field is they always seem to have a, uh, a personal story or a story of a friend or relative that kind of inspired them to work in the health world. So I wanted to know what's yours. What, what inspired you to get into uh, working with health? Uh, thank you for asking me that. I, I rarely get asked that, but I definitely have um, a story. Um, my father developed cancer when he was in his late 40s and died when he was 51. Um, and he had turned to, after going through the standard of care for uh, cancer treatment, and in those days, so this was in the 70s, um, it was actually pretty brutal what they were doing. The, the chemotherapy was very strong. The radiation therapy was incredibly harsh. Um, and he went through that and he wasn't getting better. And so he started turning towards nutrition, and um, that, that's what really intrigued me. So I was in high school at the time, and, and then I had to declare an interest. I was in a college prep school, so I had to declare an interest for studies um, at kind of a young age, and I decided to go into nutrition. So that led me into the field and then uh, ended up working with keto for epilepsy and then started working with keto for cancer. And so I kind of made a full circle back to, you know, what I really wanted to do. Okay. So, um, I've, you know, I've talked a lot about keto for health. So if you wouldn't mind, maybe we could focus in on, uh, how keto, keto and cancer interplay. Cause that's a rare topic that I get to talk about. Would that be okay with you? Yes. Um, interestingly, the history of this unique diet, um, started sort of simultaneously for epilepsy as it did for cancer. So at the Mayo Clinic, um, that's the birth of the ketogenic diet that was used to treat epilepsy. But at, the, at about the same time in Germany, it was um, being looked at in, in lab research at any rate for cancer. Um, and that really didn't come out to many until many years later. And now that research, you know, has spawned so much more research in the cancer field. Um, in, in specific cancers, you know, I ha have gotten more attention and and been more um, spoken about, particularly glioblastoma. I was just on the phone with somebody that has a glioblastoma, and they found out right. through Tom Seyfried's research about the um, you know, the potential benefit of using keto to prevent regrowth of their tumor. And so that, you know, that has pretty much taken off. And, uh, and from another aspect of cancer, I, I manage a program called Keto Diet Calculator. And I, again, it was intentionally designed for epilepsy, which is where I first started working with this diet, but it's uh, um, available to anybody, any, uh, any disorder that can benefit. And I am seeing registrations come through because I manage anybody that registers for it. I'm seeing registrations come through for centers that work specifically with cancer. So it's kind of neat to see 
that um, the cancer community, the cancer medical community, is finally embracing this. Um, and uh, even I think even more so than the epilepsy community did before there were great studies in epilepsy. And, and there aren't that many uh, studies in cancer yet, clinical studies. There's a lot of basic science studies, but there's not a, a lot of clinical studies yet to support youth. Um, but yet um, it seems like the cancer community, the medical community is saying, hey, it's, if people are willing to try it, let's support them and, and use it along with standard of care. Well, why, okay, so um, in terms of keto, that means you're looking at cancer as a at its metabolic process, how it, how it gains energy. So why do you observe that keto appears to affect cancer negatively and slow it down or stop it? Um, so so there's, there isn't just one mechanism that the ketogenic diet is being um, praised for. It, it actually has multiple, which is it's quite fascinating. And it's also hard to, I think, to alienate them from each other. So one is that it has a strong anti-inflammatory effect. And so cancer um, is, is an inflammatory process. And to have this strong anti-inflammatory effect of a diet um, is, is quite a benefit. Um, but the mechanism I think that people can relate to about keto and cancer is that we know um, that glucose feeds tumor cells. and this this process was what um, PET scans were were built upon. So PET scans, you you um, get an injection before you go in for your scan. You get an injection of glucose, which is sugar, with the radioactive dye, and the tumor eats that like candy, and um, the tumor lights up so that when they they take the picture, you see you know the tumor, and so that that process is. Been, has been proven. It's been used for many, many years to, um, you know, to show the progress of, of tumor growth, or in this case, we're hoping for um, no growth or a or, or retraction of the tumor. So that, that process is exploited by glucose. So I think people can relate to that, like, sure enough, I had a PET scan, or no, I get that. Um, but, but that is the process of, uh, of um, the ketogenic diet uh, preventing tumor growth is because it, we're restricting that energy source to cancer cells. They don't get glucose, they get ketones, and they don't recognize ketones for energy. So that's a very simplistic way to describe it. Um, but that along with the anti-inflammatory effect, and then the down-regulation of, of tumor um, activated, you know, enzymes and so forth, that's another very complex area that I don't even get, but um, that scientists continue to report on. So it's a combination of all these effects that you get from this metabolic therapy that counteract, you know, the cancer process. And so why wouldn't you want to try this if, if you are, um, if you're faced with a cancer, especially a glioblastoma? Um, I'm working with people that have different cancers that are using this diet very effectively. In fact, I have a woman with liver cancer who went through two rounds, or two rounds, excuse me, of chemotherapy, and um, and they told her there's nothing else we can do for you. Your, your cancer, um, it's going to it's going to be your demise. Um, you know, we, we 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 simply can't do anything else for you. And she, well, I have a, uh, uh, I have a, I have a, you know, uh, someone I know that's yeah, you know, they're getting chemo right now, and they told me that, mm -hmm. you know, they've been, I've been talking to them, they've been reading and. You know, I told them the, about the possibilities of fasting before chemo, that it's, you know, protective over the body. Um, and the lady told me, you know, at the chemo center, they have donuts and candy and all that. And she told them about fasting. They're like, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. You should eat. And, you know, it, it, it's just, it's ridiculous. They don't know. They don't care. They, you know, and, and her doctor's like, oh, no, this, you know, diet's not going to affect you at all. And it's just, it's crazy to me, crazy it it is and and the statement that i've heard back from a lot of patients is that the doctors told them they can eat they should eat whatever they feel like eating it doesn't matter what you eat and and that is so such damaging information it, we know that nutrients impact our body in many ways and and it, it's just like so harmful to to try and influence somebody um with that type of bad information 
when we know the opposite is true, it's like the only thing they should be eating are things that can support their health to help them recover because our bodies have this amazing ability to recover. Um, This woman with liver cancer who was told she's got about three months left came to me and uh, I like to work along with the doctor, but she said the the oncologist pretty much has dismissed her. And so I'm just working with her primary care physician who doesn't know anything about keto, but is fine, you know, is happy to go along with anything. He's kind of considering her end of life and she has, um, a very active life. She's got grandkids. She has a husband and she's not ready to give up. And, um, and she's doing really well. She's, she's just on ketogenic therapy and some supplements and she's on no medications. Um, and we're, it's been about a year that I've been working with her and, and it's, it's quite incredible to know that all that she's been through and the thousands of dollars that um, have gone into all of these expensive cancer treatments that have failed her have have not been the solution. So I have no idea how long she's going to live, but I just know that she's doing quite well. Her quality of life is is much better than when she was on her treatments. Um, So, you know, I think it's, it's a difficult kind of era right now because we're in a transition and and I'm older, right? (laughs) I've been through a lot in healthcare and I can see these trends happening where um, a new therapy comes in, it's very effective, but there's always pushback because people have not, are, are not embracing that yet. And there is no code to bill for it yet. And the studies are not um, uh, on large groups of people, yet we have these fantastic stories and anecdotal reports and, and reviews that are showing, but yeah, there's something to this. Like we need to start paying attention to this. Um, so we're in that we're in that era with with keto for cancer. We got out of that for keto with epilepsy. It's been proven for epilepsy. There's no reason why it shouldn't be tried on anybody who has failed um, to get seizure control after two medicines. It's you know we, we've gone through that whole process. I went through that process, and I'm so glad that we finally got we got the facts in place. And now it's being accepted and it should never be refused. And, and although there's still cases where people are reporting to the Trevi Foundation, for example, that, you know, no one has mentioned the ketogenic diet as an option for them. Um, that's when we try to get in and say, here's what you need to go back to them with. Here's a paper that you can take to them to say, I need to have access to this therapy, whether you're giving it to me or whether you're going to refer me to somebody who will give it to me. And I think that's going to be true for cancer as well in the near future once we get through all of these barriers. Well, um, from what I've heard, the ketogenic diet needs to be at its strictest for epilepsy patients. Have you observed the same thing for cancer patients? Like, what can you say nutritionally about how closely someone has to adhere to it? And does it need to be tailored for cancer patients depending on the cancer? Or is it just straight up keto, 80% fat, you know? A little bit of protein, et cetera. Yeah, so there's there's wide variations in um, ketogenic diets. It's not just one diet. It's not just 80% fat or 90% fat. I I don't even talk about macros until I get to know somebody and find out you know their activity level, if they've had muscle wasting, um, are they fasting at all, which can be very helpful. And then I figure out, as a, you know, I, I sit down with them and figure out what would be a reasonable macronutrient goal so they have some structure to work within. You know, how much fat should I eat in a day? How much carbohydrate should I limit myself to? How much protein do I need to take in so that I'm preserving my muscle mass and not losing it? Um, and, and there's programs that can help you um, do the math so that you whittle it down to, well, how, much, how many eggs does that mean? And how much, how much meat, or if I'm, I'm a vegetarian, how much protein does that mean I need to get? So then we get into those specifics. Um, and then it's a uh, degree of ketosis. Do I need to reach a degree of ketosis? Or is it also about my glucose? Can I get my glucose in a certain range and um, be happy with uh, the degree of ketosis? There's actually a, a, a ratio of glucose to ketones that is being suggested that's, that's been designed by actually Tom Seyfried, who's one of the premier researchers in using keto for glioblastoma. 
Um, and so this ratio is, is a, a value that you can follow day to day and trend it over time to see, um, uh, you know, it, it's a good metric to make sure that you're in a therapeutic state of ketosis that seems to be ideal for preventing tumor regrowth. Um, well, quick question so, here. Um, mm -hmm. If that ratio is important, <clears throat> would it be helped by exogenous ketones, you know, drinking ketones to push the ratio back into line when people are having trouble? That can be helpful. Um, I have uh, tried out several exogenous ketones. Um, so there's, you know, there's ketones, uh, there's three different types that I that I break it down into. First of all, they're the simplest and the most readily available and the cheapest is just coconut oil. Um, about half of coconut oil is medium chain fat, and that is more ketotic producing than all the other fats we have in our diet. And then there's an MCT oil that you can purchase that's a, a derivative of coconut oil that's just pure medium chain. So that's a liquid oil. Um, that's something that I've used for 25 years with my patients with epilepsy, and I've been using with almost everybody, I, I should say with everyone that has cancer, um, tasteless and odorless, and it's good for boosting ketones. So those are, you know, that that's sort of like my go-to, uh, let's get these into the diet right away. There's other benefits that they have. Um, they're also saturated fat. Um, which is good. We want saturated fat in a ketogenic diet. It was built around saturated fat. Um, and then there's ketone salts and ketone esters. And the salts are um, made by several different companies right now with different flavors and so forth. What, um, what I don't like about most of the salts that are out there is that they're putting uh, sweeteners in them, um, including stevia, um, and I, I don't think stevia is uh, a good sweetener. I, I actually don't think any sweetener is good. I think, for one, when you're in ketosis, your taste for anything sweet decreases significantly. Like you just don't need it anymore. Yeah, your, it does. your body actually, it does. yeah, you're kind of repulsed by it. So I find these ketone um, salts too, way too, too sweet for me while I'm in ketosis. Um, and, I, and there's well, evidence that's, that. Stevia is not good for the gut, just like saccharin and sugar alcohols aren't good for the gut. They affect the gut flora, and your gut flora is is integral to your immune function. So you don't want to mess with that. Well, I found that um, <clears throat> there's one brand, uh, Keto Force, and I'm not showing for them or anything, but um, they have no sweetener. So I would have that with um, some lemon juice in it, you know, like uh, and water, mm -hmm. and it tastes kind of like a margarita. But I would have that because I don't like I don't like drinking large amounts of fluid. So like having to drink eight or ten ounces when I can drink like two ounces is much easier and more palatable to me. And also there's no sugar in it too or sweetener, so it's an option. Oh, good. Well, that's good then. Yes, and they do. It's it gets your ketones up for a couple hours, right? Is that what you notice? Yeah, I didn't uh, test my blood very often, but. When I did do blood tests, yeah, my ketones went up to about two, two millimolars, mm -hmm. and it worked. It reduced, um, it reduced appetite, and I felt pretty good for you know a bunch of hours afterwards. So, yeah, so so that it, it, they can be helpful. Um, I, I another way to get your ketones up is fasting, and intermittent fasting is something I teach every adult that I work with. That you know, eating within an eight-hour window is usually pretty easy for an adult to do. I find that a lot of adults skip breakfast anyways. And so they're only eating, you know, between like noon and seven or eight at night. Um, but to get them kind of to tighten that up and to truly not be snacking beyond that time um, is the next step that they can take. And, and it also is good for driving up ketones and allowing gut rest. And when your gut gets to rest, it heals and it helps, you know, improve your immune system. So, um, so that's another way to generate, to get your ketones ramped up a bit. Well, in addition to the ketogenic diet, you know, I, I spoke to Tom Seyfried and he also talks about glutamine and trying to reduce the amount of glutamine available in the body. And, you know, it seemed to be his opinion that the ketogenic diet alone wasn't sufficient to do it. Have you found that the ketogenic diet is sufficient to have a huge impact on cancer or is it, is there more that's needed or are there still a lot of outliers where it doesn't help the person? 
What have you observed? Yeah. So I, I have had some people who have had phenomenal results with it. And I've had others who felt so much better, um, but ended up dying of their cancer a, a, anyways. Um, like it didn't stop the proliferation of their cancer. And I think one of the problems is by the time most people start using the ketogenic diet, they've had cancer a long time and they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're not in the early stages of it. It's not developing. They've had cancer in their body for a long time. They've gone through treatments. Um, and then the ketogenic diet is added in and it's like too late. So that, that's that been like the majority of the people that I've worked with in the first 10 years um, were in that situation. And more recently, I'm getting people who are learning about this and starting it right away, or they're starting it because a sibling or a parent had terrible cancer and they don't want, they, they want to protect themselves. Um, I do have a woman and I actually just submitted an abstract on her. Um, and she was also shown in the Netflix uh, movie, The Magic Pill, she had breast cancer. And um, this is now six years out from diagnosis. And she um, opted not to go through standard of care. And her oncologist said, sorry, then I can't be your doctor. And she left and she went to another oncologist. And he was uh, willing to take her on as long as she agreed to um, getting regular MRIs. And, um, uh, and she put herself on the ketogenic diet and then she found me and then I helped her, but she is six years out and is cancer free. And the tumor that she had, she, it wasn't surgically removed. She had thyro therapy where they just, they, uh, froze it. Um, it was a one-time treatment and then it just dissolved over time. So now her scans show, um, they don't even detect the area where that was. It just, it just says there's nothing there that the vacuole that had been there after it dissolved um, has filled in with normal tissue and she has no de detectable area of cancer. So that's a pretty amazing story for somebody that had a, um, an aggressive uh, ductal breast cancer. I, I've just written this case up. I was kind of waiting to find out, you know, her, what she was like five years out because this cancer has a uh, high remission of, um, of a reoccurrence within five years and here she is six years out and, it, and it's like she never had it. So it's a pretty significant case. I shared it with Tom Seyfried recently and I'll be presenting this in a meeting in um, LA at the end of the month. So that's like one of the most um, amazing stories that I've had, but this woman started this at the diagnosis state and, and that is not how most people are using the diet. They're starting it at the very, you know, at latent stages of cancer where I think it may be helpful, but um, certainly I think it's much, much more powerful to get it going early. And then for those of you that are in a healthy state, um, think about in terms of preventing cancer. We all have cancer cells in our body, all of us, no matter how healthy we are, they are circulating in our body and they don't, um, you know, they, they might not proliferate in, unless we're in the perfect storm of, of, of bad <laughs> um, a, a state, whether it's bad diet or a bad environment or stress or whatever, whatever is that trigger point, um, you know, then we get into trouble. But if we're taking care of ourselves, eating well, and not overwhelming our body and our gut with um, food that's not good for it. You know, it, it, you kind of take nutrition in a whole different light once you know this, how, how powerful what you put in your mouth is on, on your genes and, and affecting um, gene expression that's called epigenetics. So um, you can switch on and off genes and you can, you know, you don't want to switch on those bad genes that cause cancer because they're there. Um, but they are, you know, they're staying quite low unless you get them all mad. Um, so I, I think, I hope the message that I can give your listeners is take care of yourselves and pay attention to what you're, you eat. And with keto, you know, you, you don't say I'm going to binge today and I'll do keto tomorrow. Um, that really, that, that's really not the way we look at this. We look at it like 
making a commitment to a new lifestyle of eating clean, um, fasting um, or intermittent fasting, and then um, choosing choosing our foods wisely so that uh, our bodies can function at their their ideal best. So what I was going to ask you is when people come to you, what kind of tweaks do you have to make to your standard keto diet in order for it to be effective? You know, are there any instances of people that just have certain conditions that make it where they have to do things a bit differently than others? Yes. In fact, you know, it's funny. Almost everybody that comes to me as a client has put themselves on keto and they're looking for help because they can't get into ketosis (laughs) or can't get into consistent ketosis. So that's when I sit down with them and find out, you know, what are you actually eating? And almost all the time, it's that they're eating too much protein and not enough fat. And I can pretty much tell just by the pictures they're sending me because I'll ask them, so just take a picture of the next couple of days. Every time you eat something, send me the picture so then you don't have to write this all down. And I can tell from the pictures that they're just not getting enough fat. And they're, again, the protein portion is too big. So that's why um, when I hone them in on um, either weighing foods or measuring foods just for a, a week or two or just some meals in particular so they get what the amount should be, because I think this is a non-intuitive diet. It just doesn't make sense when you think about it, you know, like how do you equate 70% fat to something on your plate? I mean, it sounds like a crazy amount of fat, but if you're getting fat from three or four different sources of foods, how do you break that down? Like I can't even do that. I have to use a, you know, a calculator to figure that out. Um, so, so that's one thing is honing in on the macros is basically what I'm saying. Another thing is sometimes people need nutrition support supplements, um, whether it's exogenous ketones, there is um, um, an amino acid called carnitine that some people need to take. Now, not, not, I don't recommend that particularly for most people with cancer because we don't know if that's really helpful for cancer or not. But if they're not producing ketones and they are reaching their fat goals, it can be a problem in converting the fat into ketones. And so that's why we think about other um, intermediate type um, uh, enzymes or amino acids that might help with that process. And carnitine is one of them. Um, a digestive enzyme might be the trick. So, so, you know, just other issues that might come up that we hone in on to try and achieve better ketones and, and lower glucose levels that are consistent. Um, so that's what you get when you work with a professional that's experienced in this, somebody that can walk you through those, those issues to get you to your goals. And, um, and I'll have to say that even people that wh- whose cancer has not improved dramatically um, with a ketogenic diet, I, I would say 90% of the people I've worked with just feel so much better when they're following uh, this ketogenic, a ketogenic diet. Um, again, it's not a classic ketogenic diet, but it's a diet that gets them into ketosis. Um, they feel clear headed. They feel like they don't have to sleep as much. They have the energy to get up and move around. Um, and, and that's pretty incredible. So I can usually tell people that at the start, like, I don't, I'm not sure what this is going to mean in terms of cancer remission, but I can pretty much tell you, you're going to feel better. And most of them are feeling lousy to begin with because of their those therapies and what they've been through and possibly depression and so forth. So, and we know keto can be really good for, for depression. There's um, research that's been done on that. And there's a psychiatrist at Harvard who is using the ketogenic diet for his patients with um, bipolar disorder that have not responded to traditional medicine. And I've been in touch with him um, so, so I sound like a salesman here for keto, but I really, really have seen it work in most, almost everybody that has come to my uh, table or people that I've consulted for um, that have used it for, for different disorders. It, I just can't say enough about giving it a chance. Yeah, that's great. Um, it, from your perspective as a dietitian, you know, you mentioned like, oh, you know, some people may, may be failing at it or it's not working for them because they have too much protein or they're eating too much. Do you have any tools or tricks? Uh, you mentioned weighing food versus taking pictures of it. Any mm-hmm. tricks on how to uh, give people a better idea of what they're eating and if it's within the ranges they need to be or not? 
So there's, there's different programs, and I, I would recommend using a program, um, an app program to help guide you through this. I happen to be the author of one of these programs. It's called Keto Diet Calculator, and it's, you know, I designed this 28 years ago now, and we've up, made many upgrades to it. So it was designed for the classic diet, but we have um, in the classic ketogenic diet, um, we, we speak of in terms of a ratio of fat to non-fat and non-fat is protein plus carbohydrate. So a classic ketogenic diet is a four to one ratio of fat to protein plus carbohydrate. So that's 90% fat. So you're looking at every macro and every food to meet that, um, including, you know, heavy whipping cream, which has not only a lot of fat, but it's got protein and carbohydrate. So we're looking at every food and it's almost all whole foods. There's very few processed foods in this four to one classic ketogenic diet. So I designed this program so that we could follow these macros and be accurate. And I didn't create the logarithm for that diet. That diet was created in 1923. I just programmed it into a database so that we could use that to calculate out grams of foods for meals. Um, and then we expanded that so that it would calculate out a three to one and a two to one and a one to one diet, which we, we tend to use these lower ratio diets for adults who have higher protein needs than young children. So, so it does um, ultimately create meal plans with gram weights for each food in the meal. Um, and on these lower ratio diets, we are able to use things like, um, keto bread, you know, that somebody has manufactured and has provided a food label for, we can plug that into the program. So we can use keto bread or we can use um, someone's recipe of coconut muffins that they created from scratch. Um, so, so these are, these give the diet more um, uh, flexibility so that people are more likely to stick with them. But the rest, the recipes generate uh, gram weights for each item and you weigh those out for a meal. And then you find that over time, if you eat these consistently, they put you in a consistent state of ketosis. And then we can adjust them if we need to for more calories or less calories or less fat or more fat, whatever. We have the ability to adjust and um, make changes. And it's, it's like science. You know, you, you, you start with a very black and white diet of exactly these, this amount of fat, protein, and carbohydrate, and it produces ketones of this degree and glucose of this degree, and then you can adjust it over time. So that's the diet that we used for many years that was designed like that for epilepsy. And then we've made modifications of that, not only for older people, for adults, um, but for people with different conditions like cancer, as we've been talking about, um, and, and uh, psychiatric disorders and diabetes and all these newer applications. And what we, you know, what we find that with adults is that you have to be very flexible for them to be compliant. Most people are really motivated in the beginning and then kind of lose that intensity over time. Um, but once they start getting results, and it may be like six weeks until they start getting results, um, it, you know, that's what, that's what the big kicker is, is they feel like they're getting better. They're more apt to stick with it. So personally, I <laughs> As an old nutritionist, I start everybody out on this weighing food business because I feel like it cuts through all the bullshit. <laughs> You've got to weigh food so that you get your results and then you get your head wrapped around how much fat, because it's a lot more fat than you've been used to. And it's usually less protein than you're used to. And it's usually less carb than you thought it, you, it was allowed. Um, so it gets them mm, honed okay. in on. Mm-hmm. And then they get it after they do it for several weeks and they get it and they can step away from using a scale so much and be a little bit more flexible. But I, I feel like I, I get people on a learning curve really quickly by making them weigh out their foods um, and getting their, their glucose and their ketones right where we want them right away and get them feeling good. And then they get it. Um, so it, it's, it's a, it's a great um, tool. It also is a, huge, um, a huge deal for people to take on because they need to focus on this and they can't be doing 10 other things. And uh, they need a little bit of a break from their life to focus on this. And, but they need to do that for their health. And I, I, I remind people like, listen, you're, this is a, a major call to yourself 
to stop everything and take, put yourself first, take charge of your health and do this for yourself so that you can turn this around. All right. So the protocol really would be is weigh your, <clears throat> your food first. And then once you get a feel for it, then you can eyeball it and you can know better. All right. I'm eating the right exactly. amount. Exactly. Right yeah, and that, stuff. that's my approach. And I, I find that pretty effective. I've tried, um, I, I actually give people the options. You want to weigh your food or we can do this liberal method where you're just estimating and there's apps for both. And um, yeah. most people, because I, I have a bias towards weighing, um, most people will go for weighing because they know that'll make me happy too. Um, and then, you know, I'll tell them, listen, we're only going to do this weighing bit until you get it. And then you can back away from it. Um, I find that those who go that route get the better results in terms of glucose and ketones, and then they don't have the issues with um, relearning and learning and figuring things out down the road. They, they, they just get it so much sooner. They, they don't have to um, go through so many pitfalls and finding out what's not working and why, why is it this food that they ate um, that they thought was ketogenic is throwing them out of ketosis. Well, it's because they ate too much mm. of it probably, but they don't know that unless they've actually taken the time to learn about the macros in it and weigh it out and figure out that the portion size is exactly this. Okay. And you mentioned uh, <clears throat> at the end of the month, you're speaking at the Metabolic Health Summit, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I've been interviewing a lot of the speakers. I'll be there, so I'll get to meet you in person, which would be really cool. Ah, and, uh, awesome. Yeah. But, you know, and I'm helping them to promote it because I believe in it. So I uh, just want to make mention of that to listeners that you'll be there along with a lot of other great people. That's what, uh, January 31st to February 2nd or 3rd in LA? Right, in, in uh, Long Beach, so south of Long Beach. Okay. South of LA. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay. Well, uh, what, I was just going to say I'm involved uh, in, in presenting three abstracts from three different case studies. Um, one is cancer this breast cancer person that I mentioned, and one is a, a, a disorder that no one has reported on in the literature. It's called Ehlers-Daniels syndrome. That's a really interesting case. And then the third one is a woman with uh, severe migraines, a long history of severe migraines, who um, turned to a low-carb, high-fat diet um, and got some great, amazing results. So I, I'm presenting all three of those. Um, two of them are with, with the the patients themselves, and one of them I'm just re representing her. Okay, well, that's very good. And then, All um, right. in the me in the meantime, for people that can't attend, and I hope everyone can, but uh, for people that can't attend, what are some resources that you can offer them? You mentioned a calculator. Um, you know, let's let's tell listeners about what you have to offer there. Um, yeah, so Team Diet Calculator, they have to go through a licensed nutritionist to get to it, but I don't mm -hmm. mind plugging Chronometer. Um, Chronometer is another program and you can use gram weights in there. That's, it's a free program. Um, and the basic level I, is still free from what I understand. Um, so that, that would, if, if you're out looking for an app that you just want to try out, I would start with that one. But my keto diet calculator, we require, because this is a nonprofit that, uh, supports it. Um, we require a licensed nutritionist, uh, give you access so that they can set up a proper diet calculation for you and then um, let you go in and design meals. Other resources, um, Charlie Foundation has a great resource link. So if it's at the very top, you just click on resource, you'll see um, there's ketogenic specialists that are listed. You can uh, request a consultation. Um, it's paid, of course, you, you don't have to pay for it. Um, but there's also media, um, so booklets, cookbooks, uh, and the most visited page on the Charlie Foundation website is actually the recipe page. So we have a, a wonderful woman who designs recipes um, for her loved one who is on keto for epilepsy. And, um, and I designed some of them myself, but we have, we have a great array of, of recipes on there that uh, you can check out. Okay. Excellent. Well, very good. Well, Beth, I really appreciate you coming and uh, looking forward to seeing you personally. And I thank you for, uh, for sharing your knowledge. It's been great. See you in a few weeks. Okay. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. 
In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.